Great. So first talk of the morning is uh, Ilan Hirschberg um, from Ben Gurion University. We're going to talk about values of Rockland dimension uh, for finite group actions on C square algebras. Yeah, uh, thanks. So, um, I wonder if whether to what. Um, to what extent I should apologize because uh, the talk isn't that logic related, and I, I, I was deliberating with myself whether I should give a talk on things which I've done which are actually logic and, and operator algebras with with Elias, but that they're a little bit older, about uh, maybe three years old, uh, or talk about something more recent. And I felt compelled to talk about something more recent, uh, which might nonetheless interest logicians. Uh, Thankfully, I was told there, there was open problem session that time will help resolve my dilemma because I was wondering whether I should switch my talk until yesterday. And then I thought, well, there's an open problem session. So in the open problems, I can discuss open problems related to that other work. Uh, so, and that, then uh, that's why I don't have to apologize. Then. I'm not apologizing for giving this talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I heard that in Canada people apologize a lot, so I'm trying to fit in. Right? This, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, right. So, uh, let me nonetheless say why I picked this uh, uh, paper aside for that being recent. Um, so, it, so I want to talk about finite group actions and and some invariants associated to them, um, and. Uh, it is peripherally related to logic in the sense that uh, way back when Elias was working on that paper with uncountable even the author is about model theory for operator algebras, uh, you remember he talked to me about that too, and we were discussing whether we can throw in group actions, and we somehow decided that for infinite groups, things don't really work very well, but for finite groups, you can actually, um, to some extent, do it, and it was even done to some extent by um, Lupini and, 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 and Gordela. Uh, but, um, um, there's more work to be done. Uh, so, I mean, various things we heard about, for example, this um, uh, games on AF algebras, you could try to do it in, in a equivariant setting, throw in a group action, um, a finite group action. Uh, and that's why I thought it might, it might be worth kind of um, describing this talk also in a way of um, showing what kind of techniques come up. Uh, and how do you go about proving those types of results with the hopes that maybe someone would find that interesting or useful for uh, other stuff. So um, uh, this actually works for compact groups as well. I'll say if compact Lie groups, I'll say a few words on that maybe, but let's focus on finite groups. So, um, so for this talk, uh, a would be a unital and separable. Uh, G or other groups which will come up for the finite group. And uh, alpha will be an action. Um, so the original motivating question, uh, well, it's a general motivating question. If we take a C star algebra A and a group acting on it, and A has some nice properties, you want, might want to wonder uh, under what conditions would those nice properties pass through the cross product. So for example, the original motivating question here original. Uh, so suppose A has, let's say, finite nuclear dimension. Uh, does uh, the cross products.
Um, and at least for finite group actions, we don't have any counterexamples. Um, so, um, but often the property which is useful for getting uh, various um, regularity properties to pass, uh, pass around is something called the, uh, uh, the Rochen property. In, in phenomenal of the theorem, uh, due to Cohen for integer actions, then due to Jones for finite group actions, and Okniano for a more general amenable setting. Um, in sister algebra, it's not a theorem, it's a property, which you may or may not have. And, 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 um, and that property has various generalizations, uh, uh, which, um, and Rochen dimension is one of them. Uh, and actually, uh, um, the way Rochen dimension came about was that we first had, we simply had the proof that uh, this, the answer is yes, if we have the Rochen property. Uh, Rochen, the Rochen property uh, involved projections. If you know what it is, and and we realized that we actually didn't use the fact that the projections are projections uh, in the proof. So we thought, well, maybe we can generalize that, and that turned out to be some, some more um, general uh, property. So let's give the uh, definition. Um, so so we say that. Um, uh, alpha has Rochen dimension D, and I'll put um, I, there are two versions, so I'll put um, visible. We have uh, two versions with and without commuting towers. So I'll put the extra condition in red. Uh, if D is the least um, integer, positive, or natural number, uh, this is a logic uh, talk. So zero is a natural number. Um, <laughs> uh, such that, um, yes, but zero are usual sister algebra. Yeah, well, that, that's, uh, um, yes, <laughs> okay. Uh, such that the following hold, uh, for any finite set and for any epsilon, uh, there are. Uh, contractions uh, say G, where G is the element of the group, and L goes from 0, 1 through uh, D. So these are uh, contractions. Uh, such that uh, the following hold, uh, first of all, uh, and you could have some variations. I mean, some of those you can make them approximate and some precise, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, such that, first of all, uh, everything here is a partition of unity. To um, we want them to be uh, almost permuted by the um, so uh, first of all any any two think of this upper thing as as the color so we have this uh, kind of partition of unity divided into d plus one colors right okay so any two elements in each color are orthogonal or almost orthogonal so um, for any l and for any g different than h. Uh, F G L so things are almost orthogonal. Uh, three 
uh, they get almost permuted by the group action. So uh, for any um, G and H in the group, uh, alpha G of if L and for any L, uh, H is approximately if G H L. And last, uh, we want them to be almost central. So we want them to almost commute with those elements in F. Okay, so um, of course I could have rephrased that as, as uh, those elements living in the central sequence algebra. And then uh, instead of epsilons, we, we, we have fewer quantifiers and, um, and uh, things are precise. But, uh, and uh, the, the last condition is how, which I'll put in red, this is this commuting tower condition. I mean, notice I said that, um, uh, these are almost, almost orthogonal, so the in particular almost commute. But I didn't say anything about uh, towers of different colors. So we can add that as another condition and ask whether um, uh, they all commute or almost commute. Okay, so when we introduced it, number uh, five, it wasn't clear if that was really an extra condition uh, or not. It, it just um, turned out that this was used for, I mean, we have, there are various permanence results saying that if uh, A has nice property X, then so does the cross product, assuming fine interrelation dimension. And for some of those properties, uh, uh, number five was needed and for some it was not. And it wasn't even clear if we don't if we have it automatically or not. Uh, for the integers, it seems that it's probably automatic, although it's not quite a theorem, at least in many in, under some conditions. Uh, for finite groups, it turns out that those things are quite different. Um, so, for example, uh, we know that uh, uh, some previous paper that uh, I have with, with Chris that um, with um, uh, for, if we look at actually the Giants 2 algebra, let's say of Z mod 2, or, or finite groups in general, right? So, so uh, we know that um, if we have, um, we know that if we have a, a, a finite group action on the Giants 2 algebra, which is so-called strongly outer, meaning that it's outer as when we look at the um, uh, action on the weak closure, on the hyperfinite to one factor, uh, then uh, that has to have um, a finite Rochel dimension, in fact, at, at most two. Probably one, but we, we can get two, and uh, that's uh, and whereas on the other hand there are no actions of any finite group on the Giants two algebra which has finite Rochel dimension with this extra condition. So there are some um, so, so 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 those are certainly different conditions. But um, uh, up until recently, up until and what what motivated this paper was that we had a unique example uh, in this paper I have with uh, uh, Rebio and uh, Luis Santiago, where we managed to construct an example of an action of Z mod two. Uh, on some CSR algebra such that um, uh, without condition five, we get one, and with condition five, we get D equals two. So that shows that they're not, it's not just that one of them can't happen and the other can, but actually they could both be finite and have different, different values. But that was basically the only example we had. And in particular, we didn't have any example where the value was more than two. Now, um, so that, that, now this raised some questions because uh, in the, um, in, in the case of nuclear dimension, uh, for simple CSR algebra, it's known that the only possible values are uh, 0, 1, and infinity. And, 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 and before th th that was known, there was some dimension reduction in the results as, uh, as well. So, I mean, before it was known that uh, the only values of 0, 1, and infinity, it was known that, uh, you know, that it has to be less than 3 or something, right? So, um, so it was known there's there, there a big gap, right? So somehow nuclear dimension, what? Uh, right now, no. Now, now it's not. Now it's known. Period. Yes. Now it's known. Uh, right. So, um, 
So, uh, right, the only possible values are, I don't want to list the authors because it's a different long list, but uh, that's uh, uh, zero, one, and, and most of them are here, or some of them are here, some. Uh, <laughs> what? Yes, in a simple case, yes, in a simple case, right? But it means at least, at least in a simple case, we know that nuclear dimension is a very important concept, a crucial concept for classification. It's not an interesting, okay, uh, some people think it's an important concept. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, arguably, it's an important concept. <laughs> but uh, it is not a um, it is not an interesting invariant for the C-star algebra. I mean, the only if for for simple uh, C-star algebras, basically, what you know is the possible values are zero, one, and infinity, where zero means that um, uh, you're AF, one means that you're nice but not AF, and infinity means that you're you're uh, we don't know what to do with you right now. Right, and, and that's pretty much it, right? Um, and so, so you know, and, and there is some indication that without those condition five, the situation might be similar for uh, uh, Russian dimension. Uh, for, for actually simple C-star algebra, it's not a theorem yet. It's it's only in some, some special cases we can't get one, and and but um, so um, okay, so so. Uh, so, as I said, we had this example showing those things are different, but the main the, the um, um, question we want to address now is the question of, okay, is Rochman dimension, uh, aside from being a tool for showing that various permanence properties pass, is that actually an interesting invariant for group actions? Are there, are the only possible values 0, 1, 2, and infinity, or do we, or does it actually say something more about the group action itself? And um, the, so, 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 um, and, and so, okay, so uh, the upshot is yes, and uh, what I want to is um, explain the results and uh, discuss at least the ideas of uh, the proof. How do we go about proving such thing? Uh, it's not really. I mean, you can, you can, for finite group actions, for infinite group actions, you, uh, you can't really uh, remove the epsilon. For finite group actions, you can easily get rid of epsilon in some of those, but not the others. So, for example, you can make this precise, but then you can't make this precise, or the other way around. Or, I, I don't think you can make it zero in all of them. You can make that. You can make that. If I mean, if you prefer, I could have written like this. That that that, that that's that's. Uh, but that's trivial to fix because if not, you can. Yeah. So so uh, in, for finite group actions, you have some flexibility. If you if you want to, if it's important for you that you know this one is epsilon is zero, you could do it. But I don't think you can make all of them zero. Okay, but but it, it doesn't really play a, an important role here. Okay, so um, um, yeah. Okay, so as 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 I as I kind of um, said, uh, we can. Um, rephrase all of it in terms of uh, what happens in the central sequence algebra and and may, maybe i'll rewrite that any, even though it's kind of a triviality to do okay what okay uh so so equivalently um so um the conditions we can be written are or uh, there exist F G L D inside of uh, the central sequence algebra. Uh, here we have an action of the group, right? So, so I'm going to call it alpha as well. Okay, so alpha induces an action on, on this, um, such that uh, everything holds Exactly, right? We don't have to write uh, number four because number four is already encoded here. Uh, but uh, so that we have one uh, repetition of unity. Two. Um, Um, three um,
And if I call condition 5, 4, so we don't need to write uh, condition 4 there, uh, that would be um, for all uh, possible parameters. OK, so, um, uh, so, okay, so if we look at this, we, we just can think of these as, as a set of generators and relations for some um, commutative subalgebra, right? And it just means that we have a copy of the, that commutative, this particular universal commutative subalgebra inside of uh, the center of sequence algebra along with this action. Now, if you look at it for a while, you can actually identify that explicitly. It was done in some papers. It was, uh, we found it in uh, Gabor Sabo's uh, paper. It was, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's not very hard to, um, it's just a matter of kind of staring at this. Uh, and you can say, see that the universal uh, generated uh, by relations one to four, so I'm including uh, the commuting towers one, uh, it simply is uh, the continuous functions on the um, D fold or D plus one fold join uh, of the group G. So what is the join? Um, the, the join of, of two finite sets, you could define for any topological spaces or at least um, outsource. Places and not uh, so is so you basically take all the lines between between two things. So if I have uh, two sets um, if I have uh, sets, uh, then uh, this join construction, that's a construction used in algebraic topology, is, uh, is, is a space of all lines connecting x and, the, x and y. And y. Let's um, write that more uh, explicitly. Well, I mean, it's a subalgebra. So, so my point is that we have an embedding of this, or at least a unital homomorphism from this particular uh, universal sister algebra into the central sequence algebra, which is equivariant with respect to a group action, which I'll describe. OK? Yes, I mean, because ignore, ignore A, right? Let's look at conditions one through four, right? There's no A uh, in those conditions. So, so I, I'm putting those elements in the central sequence algebra which satisfy those relations. Now, in the relations, there is no A, right? Well, yeah, of course. But what I'm saying is that you look at the algebra generated by relations one through four, right? Okay, by generators in the relations. That's a that's a that's a given Caesar algebra not related to any particular. Sister algebra A, and what we're saying is that uh, finite Rochel dimension with commuting towers is the same thing as saying that we can embed or at least map this kind of Caesar algebra, this particular one, uh, equivariantly into the central sequence algebra. Okay. So what, what's the. What's the. Function? Yeah, this, this is just a space. Okay, so, so uh, the join. We can write this as um, x cross y cross 0, 1, modular equivalence relation. 
Uh, uh, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll just draw a picture to make, to make that clearer. So suppose I take, um, um, here's x, and let's say here's y. Um, let's, you know what, let's draw it like this. What do that one? Uh, here's, let's say, y. And let's suppose x is a space of two points. Okay, I'm drawing deliberately like this. Okay, so here's x. x is the two red points. y is the two uh, white points. And what I'm doing is simply connect any two points with a, um, with a line. So, okay. So, um, okay, and, and you can of course repeat that. I mean, if you, you now can put uh, some other set and connect all these. Now you have to, you have to, and I'll, I'll let you decide what the equivalence ratio is. Okay, it's not uh, hard to write, but um, so for example, so, so this is the, what the join of the two-point set and the three-point set looks like. Okay, as you can see, it's, it's, um, it's some graph in this case. Um, it's, it's not a manifold, right? We have, uh, the, these are some exceptional points, right? Um, what, what that? No, the, the, group, the, the, the group will be uh, the set of vertices. Yeah, here it's just you can do it for any two spaces, right? Any two topological spaces. You don't need anything, right? Okay, you, uh, once you write down the correct equivalence relation, which is not hard to see. Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, the, the fact that the group will be important uh, in a moment because we're going to have an action. Um, okay. So, right? Or if we if we like to let's let's if we have a two point set, maybe that's. Uh, Let's draw the same picture with two points. So suppose uh, we have uh, here's x and here's y. So if we take the join of a two-point set with itself, okay, and I drew it deliberately like this, not one next to the other, it's easier to see what happens. Then we just connect these two, and we connect these two, and we get a circle, right? Now, if I, if I want to join it again with a two-point set, then maybe it's easier to put one on one top, one on the bottom, and you see we get a sphere, right? And and so on and so forth. So so if we take the two point set, uh, so if we take uh, uh, z mod two, and we take its repeated join d plus one times, right? And the, the plus one was a pain when you wrote the paper; we kept getting it wrong. Um, then um, what we get is let's see when we take the um, we should get the sphere. This is going to be the sphere of dimension D, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, if we take the one foiled loin is just the original uh, two point space. The two point space is a zero sphere, and we keep on going. Okay? What? No, if I take, if I take it with itself, now if I, if I do it three times, if I take uh, Z2, Z2 join Z2, so now it's a circle, right? And now I join it again with Z2. Then now I have a circle and two more points. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, 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 so I, I get in general, I get, I get the sphere, but notice that if I, did, if I had a situation where I took the three point set, I, don't, I, I could draw a three and three, it would be a bit nastier, right? Think about it for a moment. It's not a manifold, right? So the fact that we get here, we happen to get a sphere, is a particularly nice uh, occasion because Z mod 2, but it works just for Z mod 2. For finite, other finite groups, if we have more than two points, we're going to get some simplicial complexes which are not manifolds. And that, that was a headache uh, for us for uh, other um, uh, uses. Okay, so um, now if we have a group action, let's say on acting on X and on Y, we have an induced action on, on this joint construction. Okay, it, it, it immediately induces something because, right, it, you simply act on x and y. You have to you squeeze the uh, endpoints to uh, so uh, that gives you the um, uh, right. It, it, it's one endpoint. All the things which are y are squeezed to a point. All the other ones, all all the ones which are x are squeezed to a point. 
Uh, so if you have an action on X and on Y, that gives you an action on the join. Okay, so in particular, if we have, if, if our uh, spaces are the group itself, we have the left translation action, that gives us an induced action on, on the G full join. Okay, so the action of uh, G on self uh, by translation, let's say left translation induces a free action, a free simplicial action on the join. Okay. Uh, right, and and uh, so the uh, fine trochal dimension with commuting towers is we can simply say that we have an we have an embedding of this uh, particular universal C star algebra into uh, the central sequence algebra, which is equivariant with respect to this action. So we have a, the canonical action here and the given action on the central sequence algebra. Maybe I'll write that. Uh, so, uh, what's it called? The Russian dimension with commuting towers of alpha is uh, less or equal to D if and only if uh, there exists an equivariant uh, uh, unital homomorphism from this universal algebra into the central sequence algebra. Okay, so this is just, um, um, I'll say soon why this point of view is um, useful. Um, okay, so, um, so let's take the theorem. Um, so uh, there exists uh, for any uh, finite group G and for any, let's say, uh, B, uh, there exists uh, a, a simple unital AF algebra with a new trace. And an action uh, such that uh, the Rochman dimension commuting towers of alpha is uh, finite and at least d. Now, if the group happens to be Z mod 2, we could do somewhat better. Uh, we can find uh, uh, an AF algebra. Uh, a simple unital AF algebra with unique trace and the sequence of actions
let's say alpha m from z mod 2 to the automorphisms of a such that uh, the Rochen dimension we can down the Rochen dimension of uh, this uh, action in this interval between 2m plus 2 and m. So the improvements are, first of all, we can give both an upper and a lower bound. I can tell you roughly what interval it's in, uh, as opposed to just saying it's more than something. And secondly, we, all of those actions are on the same C -star algebra. Uh, in, 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 for general groups, at least in our construction, um, you know, you, um, uh, the algebra depends on the D. Right? We, 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 I mean, maybe one can work around that, but at least the way we did it, um, when we um, change the, uh, the group in the D, we end up with a different, uh, different case here. What's wrong with... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but who, who says that, that the Rochen dimension will go down? Well, we have an example like that, <laughs> in fact. I'll, 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 if I have time, I'll say something about that. Um, okay, so um, we have similar uh, similar results for uh, actions of connected compact Lie groups, uh, although the only difference is that we get, first of all, I have to define what Rochel dimension is for compact groups, which we're not going to do. And secondly, instead of AF, we have to take uh, AH. But aside from that, we get pretty similar results. Uh, I thought I'd focus on finite groups. Uh, for this, and maybe just to address uh, what Ilya said, uh, because uh, so before I go into the idea of the proof, I'll just give the uh, uh, so, not sure if it's called theorem or an example or a remark. <laughs> remark. Uh, we can construct uh, two actions. Uh, alpha one and alpha two of the group Z mod six on uh, AF algebras uh, let's say that uh, for any D uh, such that uh, the Rochen dimension of alpha one and the, the uh, Rochel dimension of alpha two are uh, greater than D, but uh, the product, the tensor product has a Rochel property, which uh, we write as Rochel dimension zero. So uh, actually, for we, we look at tensor products and actually um, there's, a, there's kind of an obvious upper bound uh, well, not, uh, the upper, upper bound is the maximum, right? So, but um, but uh, it turns out you could drop. And we're not sure how, how I mean, okay, we had an example where we dropped to zero. We don't have an example where we dropped to something which is not zero, although I suspect that with more work, we could do it. If not, uh... okay. Um... Uh, yes, in some sense. I mean, there's there's uh, some similarities in the construction. I think it really goes back to that to some extent. I think that's reasonable to say. Okay, so let's um, so time I have remaining. Let, let's let's uh, say some words about the idea of the proof. So I want to talk about, um, uh, give you a brief five minute course in equivariant K theory. Okay, so for um, 
Okay, so for, at least for, let's say, for unital sister algebra and up to, uh, we, we construct k0 out of projections in matrices over A, right? I mean, a very short way of saying k-theory with, without, right? Okay, so, so k0 uh, is constructed of out of projections in uh, matrices or A, right? Uh, okay, that's, I guess that's good enough for a 30-second uh, description. And uh, so now suppose we throw in a group action or a, a, an action of a finite group, then um, what we want to do is we, first of all, uh, we need to make, we somehow want to make everything invariant. But uh, so we, we can look at invariant projections but uh, we don't just look at MN because MN might have an action on it as well. Okay? So, so it's not just taking uh, invariant projections in, in A uh, and, and look at matrices over that, but we have, to actually, we have to allow for an action on MN, meaning that we, we, we want to replace MN by a representation space of some uh, representation of the group. So in the, uh, so for, uh, K0G uh, is constructed of out of uh, projections in things of the form um, B of uh, some, some representation space, let's say H tensor uh, A, where H is a fine dimensional representation of G. Okay, and we look at, uh, at uh, constructed out of, let's, let's say, invariant projections. Okay, uh, so we have an action here, we have an action here, this, we have an action of this whole thing, we look at invariant projections, and we also need to make a more phenomenon equivalence invariant. Right, so, so uh, I have something here, and I have something in B of H2, tensor, uh, tensor A. Um, I need to, 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 to make sure the, the elements which, make, which check whether things are invariant are, um, are, um, uh, uh, are equivalent or not, are invariant as well, right? So I'll say and. And invariant Mori phenomenon equivalence. Okay, and similarly you define K1. Okay, so I think that for a uh, four-minute course in the equivariant K theory, that's that's um, enough. Um, for more, you have Chris has a book. <laughs> um, now, um, okay, maybe, maybe uh, I'll expand the course by one minute and mention that there is um, Joule's theorem uh, says that um, this equivariant K theory of A is simply the uh, K theory of the cross product. So you might wonder what's the point. Um, I mean, having have this theorem, you say, well, okay, we can just um, you know, forget about it. Uh, but no, you should read Chris's book because um, uh, the, 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 what's, uh, what's important about that construction, which is not visible here, is that this is an, an isomorphism as abelian groups. However, this is not just uh, an abelian group. It is a module over the representation ring. And that, that, that's critical. No. Um, I don't think you see the order structure in the representation ring. I mean, they're two different things. Um, well, I think it's ordered. Yes, it's, it's ordered, right? But, uh, yeah. Sure, sure, yeah. sure it is. Yes, yes, it's ordered. Nobody's, uh, Look yeah. at it as an order of rank only. Yeah. An 
R of G is order that that you have the action with respect to order. Yeah, so um, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's this? Uh, what you do is you simply look at all the uh, finite dimensional representations of, of the uh, group G, okay? Look, look at uh, th that is um, a more, uh, kind of up to, up to um, unitary equivalence. That's a monoid under a uh, tensor product. Uh, not exactly, because uh, yes, yeah, if, if, we, if we don't take irreducible ones, that, that's a monoid, okay? Uh, and basically, you complete that into in, into a group. So you take take all the irreducible representations, if you want, or, or either all the representations or all the irreducible ones, whatever you prefer. L let's look at um, the um, z of that. So so so, and basically turn that uh, somehow force that to be a a, a ring by uh, adding inverses, additive inverses. Okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, inside of R of G, that is the uh, representation ring. Inside of I of G, we have I of G is the augmentation ideal. Uh, that's what what happens when we uh, you know formally send all the representations into the trivial representation. Okay, so that's that's an ideal in the in, in this uh, representation uh, ring, um, and so there's a if we go back to some work of Atia Siegel. Uh, Uh, they prove that um, the if we look at the nth power of the augmentation ideal, right? That's a smaller ideal in this in this ring, and you apply that to a covariant k theory of C of this uh, n full join. That's zero, but uh, there is some larger. Uh, such that right although it's not necessarily known how big this uh, capital n could be okay so somehow using this um, Yeah, so, um, so, so, so think of the uh, representation ring as formal combinations of uh, representations with integer uh, values. Okay, now you can take all the formal, rep all the representations and just uh, simply count the dimension. So, or, or right, so, or, or in other words, or um, sorry, simply take all the representations which are not trivial, not to count the dimension. You can take all the representations and, and collapse into the identity, right? So you have some formal representation, some formal, a combination of representations. Forget the representation. Just count the coefficients. Okay, that's a homomorphism from R of G to 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 Z. That's a kernel. I mean, you can you can phrase it differently. It's not you don't necessarily have to take this. Um, I mean, it, it's 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 one of several equivalent formulations. It's the question is what's more convenient for you with this? Well, it's the same as the, do you take M in tensor A or compact tensor A? It's the same. I mean, I don't think it makes a difference. Yeah, you, you can define a covariant case theory by taking the Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll take a few minutes just to um, uh, spend some questions to, to some of say um, uh, what's, what, uh, what's our main technical theorem and, and roughly how that's used. So um, the theorem 
make sure I state it correctly without missing anything up. Okay, so theorem. Is that uh, if uh, the Rohan dimension of alpha is less equal to n, then um, the nth power of the augmentation ideal annihilates the equivariant k theory of A. Um, okay, so, um, and yeah, I'm sure I messed something up somewhere, uh, and that should, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, sure, okay, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a constant issue, I hope we fix all those in the paper, but okay, uh, so, um, right, so, so the, the point is, we, we, you take this idea as Siegel construction and somehow push it into the algebra itself. Right, so it's um, even though uh, we don't quite have this. Um, uh, this, I mean, we somehow take can take partial fragments of something, being a module into that. Um, so this gives us a way of, of of showing that something can't have Rochel dimension less than n. I mean, if you can show that this thing is not zero, you know the Rochel dimension is more than n. And then the the the, the key was to somehow uh, use part two of uh, of this. To, to try to uh, make a simple version of that, right? We have, we, we know we have a space, we have a free action on it where the Rochel dimension is uh, not zero, right? We, we know, so we know the Rochel dimension here is not zero, but that's not very exciting, that's commutative, right? However, uh, we managed to construct some sort of inductive limit, carefully done enough, and I won't describe the details because I think we're out of time, uh, such that uh, we, we can retain this in the inductive limit. Okay, so maybe that's uh, so. So some of that gives us we can get get um, uh, AF algebras and lots of various uh, kind of weird examples like that. Um, and maybe I'll just uh, okay. So I, I won't go and talk about Lie groups. I, I do want to say that this this um, shows now that we know that that Rochen dimension is not just uh, change the point of view somehow because now Rochen dimension is not just a tool to prove permanence results. It's not that we say, well, we care about whether it's finite or infinite and we don't care about what it is. And as far as we know, it can't be more than two. Uh, now we know, no, actually, actually, this is an interesting invariant for group actions on uh, Caesar algebras. We, could, we can get arbitrary large, large numbers. So for example, but we don't know anything beyond what we got here. I mean, the best result we have is, uh, did, I, did I still have it here? Um, the best thing we have is this, right? We don't even know that we can get all values. So here's, a, here's, a, here's an open question. Do we have, let's say, uh, 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 a sister algebra such that we can have all, po such that all possible values occur? Or maybe some values don't occur. Uh, is the set of values which can occur, is that an interesting invariant of the sister algebra? I mean, if it's true that all values always occur or, it's e or, 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 you know, or only zero occurs, then maybe it's not very exciting. If, if for some reason all even numbers occur and all odd numbers don't, or something like that maybe, that, maybe that's something which is worth exploring and understanding better. The second thing which might be worth looking at is, you know, we have, there are various things which are done looking at, let's say, the Rochen property. There's some work of Izumi where he classified action with the Rochen property on, on, on uh, uh, Kirchberg algebras. Suppose not all actions on Kirchberg algebras have the Rochen property. Suppose you want to go further. Well, now that we know we have some sort of a hierarchy of dimensions, I mean, you could say, well, okay, maybe instead of trying to, to classify all of them, maybe the next step up is to look at one which have Rochel dimension one, which is somehow more complex, uh, the, the next level of complication somehow, right? You could think of it as some sort of a stratif stratification by complication. And um, so, uh, talk about more open problems, but maybe, I'm, maybe I should end here. <laughs>